pause the video, draw yourself a neuron in your notes. Take your time if you need to. I'm gonna draw one for you now. That's my neuron. Cell body. Have a nucleus in there, that's fine, sure. This is the axon and these are the axon terminals. That is a basic neuron. You will see all kinds of drawings like this. Here's one neuron talking to another. Here's talking to another, et cetera. Um, and why I point this out is this example here. These are um, examples of drawings different groups of people have done. So up here, these are when undergraduates were asked to draw a neuron. These were graduate students. So people with some level of training in this area. So graduate students in some sort of neuroscience. And then these were done by um, like professionals in the field. So um, people who are neuroscientists or professors. And what is different about these, the level of detail. So this quote here is really my point. Um, undergraduates are able to replicate and make a nice picture um, of a neuron based on observations. Whereas more experienced scientists, these are more conceptual. And learning isn't really about reproducing textbook images. It's about learning science. So being able to draw a concept. Um, and that's it's also related to owning the material, not just reproducing what you read or see. Um, if you're doing that during lecture along with me, that's fine. But in order to learn it, being able to simplify it down to the basic concepts and not just draw um, the detail that you might, might see, even if it, it's pretty. It's fine to do detail some, right? Just make sure you can focus on the concepts. Okay, so that's a basic neuron. And I do want you to um, be able to start with that very basic. So I'm gonna do that again here, um, but I'm actually going to draw a little bit more detail here so that we can talk about the true detail that there is. So this would be maybe, and maybe this is what you drew, a neuron with a little bit more detail, but it's still, so pretty simple. So let's actually do some labeling here. Again, this is a multipolar neuron. Multipolar. I don't really want to use red. Let's switch to purple. And we've got our nucleus. We've got our cell body, which is also called the soma for a neuron. We've got dendrites. All these things are dendrites and one axon. We've got the axon terminals at the end. And one more I forgot to, this structure right here, like the very beginning of the axon is called the axon hillock. Hillock means hill. That's gonna be an important part, um, structure for talking about action potentials. So I wanna use this to talk about the function of neurons a little bit more in detail. So these dendrites, these are going to, let me go down here where I have room. Actually, no, I'll fit it up here. Um, these are gonna contain receptors. That might make sense, right? To receive information. So receive info. This is typically going to be chemical signals neurotransmitters from another neuron. This is a motor neuron. So remember, multipolar neurons are going to be motor or interneurons, so they're not sensory. So that's why we can say the dendrites in this case are receiving um, neurotransmitter information. You could have a neuron that receives like a mechanical or some other information, those a little, that's defined dendrites like this. 
this information is going to be converted to an electrical signal. The cell, um, yeah, sorry, the cell body is where, right, where all the organelles and the nucleus are going to be contained. And then we've got this axon, it's pretty thin. I drew this a little fat um, projecting away. This is going to be where the actual electrical signal is carried. Kind of like a wire. The axon hillock is where the electrical signal, um, actually I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, is generated in full. So the action potential. Next week will be the details of how we get from the incoming signals to an action potential um, in some cases. Not all incoming information becomes action potential. But you know voltage-gated channels are going to be involved, right, with, with the signaling. Um, at the end, this axon terminal is going to be where neurotransmitter is released. Um, I'm gonna, okay, to contact something else. What else? Well, another neuron, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, depending on what this neuron is. This area here, so one more actual um, term, this is going to be, this membrane is the presynaptic membrane. Because if we had another neuron over here, that would be the postsynaptic membrane. All right. In reality, there are about a bazillion different types of neurons that have all these cool structures. Um, this was a drawing done by Ramon y Cajal in 1906, who drew all kinds of beautiful um, observations of neurons. These here are like Purkinje cells that have a special, very tree-like um, structure. We're not going to go into all different structural categories besides the three basics that you've already seen. And here's a little bit more detail of a couple of different varieties for each one. These multipolar neurons already look a little different than what I've drawn for you, right? Um, so the type of branching that can occur is really variable. They do have a lot of branches. So what I drew like that kind of thing is definitely oversimplified, but I'd like you to be able to draw oversimplified because what's the benefit of drawing all that detail until, unless you're like learning that detail. <laughs> so multipolar neurons, these are all going to be all motor and um, interneurons. Then we've got unipolar neurons. This means there's one process coming from the cell body. That's what uni means versus multi. Um, so the, in this case, the dendrites are receiving information and carrying it this way. And this is going to be our axon terminals. So a little bit different structure there, right? These are sensory. So this could be a mechanical stimulus that would contact these dendrites. So that kind of, um, in, instead of a chemical stimulus signal. There are sensory neurons that detect chemicals though. Dendrites are where information is received. Yeah. Bipolar, these are going to be our special senses. These are more rare. So we won't see these until um, the end of the semester. Bipolar means two. So in this case, dendrites, information is coming this way um, and traveling out this way. Here is our axon terminals. So those are just named for the number of processes, but then they tend to be located in different places. The anatomy of unipolar neurons will be apparent. Um, okay, let me just tell you now. So let's say this unipolar neuron is located in the skin, the, the dendrites. This is our painful stimulus. Do we want to have our cell body like right here, right? Like on this, in our particular dermis? No, that's a bad place to have a 
really important um, thing, which the, the cell body of a neuron is. We can regenerate some parts of neurons. Um, let's keep that, let's keep that cell body alive though. This is gonna be located near the spinal cord, actually in the ganglia. G ganglion, there's one. So it makes sense. We'll see it again, but that's um, a way to think about why those are that way. All right, last thing for the, the cells of the nervous system are those neuroglia um, that we've briefly talked about in lab. So there are four types of neuroglia in the, in the central nervous system. These are astrocytes, um, which are for support. Um, they physically support, they regulate the, um, they, they produce growth factors, they regulate the extracellular composition of ions, um, promote synapse growth and connectivity. They actually are really important to help to support the, the neurons themselves. The microglia are the immune cells of the CNS. So they are actually able to um, phagocytose, so ingest foreign cells or um, dead material, stuff that shouldn't be there. So pretty important um, task. Then we've got ependymal cells. This here is actually the um, where CSF is located. We'll look at that more. So these cells are actually um, produce, produce the CSF. I probably should say what that is. That's cerebrospinal fluid. important for um, maintaining brain homeostasis. So they're gonna line all the cavities and actually um, produce and secrete the, the CSF. Lastly, we've got oligodendrocytes. Can you see what these do? These are going to produce our myelin sheath, which I have not drawn yet in any of your neurons. So the axon is of many neurons are covered with this myelin sheath that I'll talk about um, more later. So oligodendrocytes form the myelin sheath in the brain and spinal cord, the CNS. So this is CNS. There are two in the PNS that have functions that are the same as the ones in the CNS. So first, um, we'll actually go with those, the, the myelin sheath ones in the PNS is Schwann cells. And actually in this case, I'm gonna say they form, it's subtle, I'm not gonna test you on that. They form the myelin sheath. It's a little bit different mechanism they use. They literally like, this is one cell, this is another cell, this is another cell. They, the cells wrap around, um, the axon and also help with regeneration so and repair, which is particularly important for the peripheral nervous system, right? Because we've got these, these are nerves that are more likely to be damaged than our central nervous system, hopefully. All right, so Schwann cells. And then number two is satellite cells. These surround the cell bodies. So where would these be? These are gonna be in the ganglia, right? That's the only place there's cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system. Um, and these are going to um, be providing kind of insulation support, what do we call it? So it says support, it's similar to astrocytes also regulate, regulating that chemical environment of, of the neurons um, here. Satellite cells are actually 
present in other organs as well. So there's satellite cells that are a little bit different, but that help um, support muscle cells as well, for example. Those are the cells. 